I'd like to do a roll call. We do have two members that are virtual, so I don't think we need to say that they're virtual, but we'll start with Kendra. Kendra, are you here? Good morning, I'm present virtually. Okay, Amy Paradis. Present virtually. Ben? Present. John? Present. James? Present. Rabib? Present. Mike? Present. And Rhonda, I am here. So, did we look at those um, minutes from last time? Any changes? Can I get a motion to approve? All right, I'm just going to ask for a unanimous consent. All right, thank you. Um, board members, have we had the opportunity to review the agenda? Okay. The chair would like to make a addition to the agenda under the remarks and remembrance. We're going to change that section to remarks and remember remembrance of uh, board members and board staff. I would formally like to add the name Patricia Patty, and I'll spell the last name B E L L I N O. It is very important um, that we recognize the contributions of um, the people who came before us. So that is the only update I have. Can I get a motion to approve with that correction, please? Second. All right, and I will just ask for a unanimous consent. Thank you so much. Um, with that being said, I would like to turn the next item over to um, my wonderful colleague, Amy Carlson. I will remind board members that this is the only item that we will be voting on today. Good morning and thank you. I would just like to remind the board members for the variance report. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, when the vote comes by, just remind yourself to abstain from any voting on issues that involve any pharmacies owned by your employer. For this agenda, we would have um, board member Mike Haig, board member Ben Mossenbach, and board member President Rhonda Chikolas for abstaining. Thank you. Any discussion for any of these items <laughs> presented by the committee? Can I get a motion to approve the report as written? Motion to approve report as written. All right. Um, I would like to take a roll call vote and I will start with Dr. Kendra Metz. Approve. Amy Paradis. Approve. Ben? Uh, I abstain from voting on any issues involving my employer, but approve all other variances. John? Approve. James. Approve. Rabib. Dr. Haig. Uh, approve abstaining from any matters involving my employer. And I am Rhonda Chikolas. I approve and abstain from any matters involving my employers with an S. Thank you. Um, I would like to turn over uh, the agenda to uh, my wonderful colleague here, um, Katrina, and she'll be introducing um, our next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before introducing our next guest, I would like to provide some background information regarding this topic. In 2023, legislation was passed that required Minnesota to establish a psychedelic medicine task force. The task force is tasked with advising the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in this state. For the purposes of the task force, Psychedelic medicine means psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA. The task force has over 20 appointed individuals, of which our executive director, Jill Phillips, is one of. Earlier this year, Lycos Therapeutics announced that the FDA had accepted its new drug application, or, or NDA, for MDMA capsules used in combination with psychological interventions and guided therapy for individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The FDA has granted the application priority review and assigned a PDUFA date of August 11th of this year. So PDUFA stands for Prescription Drug User Fee Act, and the PDUFA date serves as a target date in which the FDA aims to respond to a new drug application by. 
MDMA treatment is controversial, and just recently it was announced that an FDA advisory panel rejected MDMA therapy for PTSD, expressing concerns that the benefits don't outweigh the risks. Nevertheless, with a pending approval, representatives of Lycos Therapeutics are here today to provide board members with information about this drug. MDMA is currently a Schedule One controlled substance, both federally and in the state of Minnesota. If approved, the drug will be rescheduled presumably to a Schedule II or three um, controlled substance, and depending on the timeline, may require our board to issue a scheduling order. A scheduling order would temporarily reschedule the drug in the state of Minnesota until the legislature can make it permanent in statute through the legislative process. Um, our board has experience in issuing scheduling orders and most recently did so in March of 2022. So with all of that said, I would now like to turn things to the representatives of Lycos Therapeutics, um, and we'll get you situated probably at the table um, and get some microphones for you. And then if you could please um, introduce yourselves and share a little bit about what you do prior to beginning the presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Just, yep, selecting the green button will get you the audio. Thank you. Hi, good morning, and thank you. Uh, Gretchen Schaub, I am on the government affairs team for Lycos Therapeutics, and I guess we can just do the intro. Sure, Ryan Lassab, I'm the medical science liaison for the Southeast area, also a pharmacist by training and licensed in Louisiana and California. Hi, good morning, uh, John Kim, I lead our trade and distribution function at uh, Lycos Therapeutics. To the next slide. Thank you. And as uh, we've already reviewed, so thank you for, for the intro. We are currently still under review with the FDA. Um, we did recently have our advisory committee meeting um, on June 4th, and we are still working with the agency um, towards our PDUFA date. And if we do get approval, then DEA has 90 days federally to move our product from a schedule one to either a, a two or a three. Most likely we um, don't have purview over what DEA will ultimately decide, um, but most likely two or three. Um, and then all 50 states have an individual process for rescheduling um, as was noted. And so that is part of why we are here and educating on the process and, and hopefully getting to know the folks in Minnesota that are making those decisions along the way um, as the first step towards patient access should we gain approval. And so I will leave it with Ryan now to walk through some of our clinical data. Thanks, Gretchen. And thank, thanks everybody for the time uh, today. We'll do a little presentation on both disease state of PTSD and then an overview of our clinical studies. Uh, we'll start with the unmet need of PTSD. Uh, there are around 13 million patients in the US who are thought to have PTSD, the majority of which are actually undiagnosed and just over 5 million are officially diagnosed. Um, this, you know, you can do a whole presentation on this, but unlike many disease states, uh, PTSD um, actually has more severe patients than it does mild, although it's cut roughly into thirds. And part of that is, you know, we have a suboptimal healthcare access. Um, the first line treatment is often considered to be therapy, and that can be hard to access in particular. And there's also a stigma, uh, as you're all probably very familiar, around PTSD, uh, which makes it difficult for patients to seek treatment and also to continue on with treatment once they do get a diagnosis. We can continue on to the next slide. So now we'll review our clinical data in our MAP1 and MAP2 studies as part of our clinical trial program. These are the phase three studies. So uh, mitomethetamine, as it will be referred to if we were to get a label and approval, uh, assisted therapy is an acute treatment over the course of 18 weeks. Uh, now, MAP1 and MAP2 were published in the journal Nature Medicine, and these were your typical uh, phase three type studies. They were double blind, placebo controlled, randomized uh, studies. And participants were randomized into a therapy uh, plus placebo arm or an MDMA assisted therapy arm. So, really, an active comparator here because you have therapy versus that 
of MDMA versus uh, plus therapy. Uh, there were three treatment cycles in each of these uh, studies. The studies were very similar. We'll, we'll take a look at the small differences between them. But in general, there were three uh, treatment cycles, the first of which patients were, uh, they began with preparation sessions. They were introduced to their therapists. They were made sure they were correct for therapy uh, and that it was the right therapist for them during preparation. There were three such meetings. Uh, then patients would enter cycle one, where they would receive a total dose of 120 milligrams of MDMA, which was separated as an 80 milligram oral dose, followed by a 40 milligram oral capsule dose about 90 minutes later. And during this time, uh, during the experimental session, they would also receive eight hours of therapy. Uh, the next day, uh, the therapist and patient would meet for an integration session, followed by an additional integration session one week later. And then they would enter cycle two and cycle three, which were identical. Cycle two uh, was the same one experimental session with MDMA plus assisted therapy. The dose is a little bit higher this time, 180 milligrams total dose, uh, which was split into 120 milligrams at the beginning of the session, followed by 60 milligrams about 90 minutes later. A quick note that second dose is optional based on how the patient is proceeding. And endpoints were taken at the end of 18 weeks. So we'll go on to the next slide. Thank you so much. So again, MAP1 and MAP2 were very similar to one another. Um, patients were all adults with at least six months of PTSD since their PTSD diagnosis. MAP1 only had severe PTSD patients, so a CAPS-5 score of at least 35. Uh, the MAP2 trial did include moderate to severe PTSD patients. So the uh, cutoff there was 28 or greater on the CAPS-5. Uh, we excluded a number of psychotic disorders, uh, pretty typical in a trial such as this. And also because this is a sympathomimetic, any medical conditions that could be exacerbated by blood pressure or increase or increased heart rate. And go on to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. So let's take a look at the actual patients that were in the studies. Uh, average age was around 40 across across both studies. Majority female. This is owing to the large amount of uh, sexual trauma that takes place and causes PTSD uh, in our population. Um, Long-standing PTSD, while it was only required to have a diagnosis of six months, most patients had a duration of at least 15 years. Many had tried other treatments for their PTSD. Uh, the average CAPS-5 score, this is one difference between the two studies, was 44 in MAP-1 because it was only a severe population. It was closer to 39 in MAP-2 because we did include moderate uh, PTSD patients in this study. Okay. Next slide, please. These are the primary endpoints that are graphed here. I'll orient you to the graphs. Uh, on the y-axis is the CAPS-5 total score. We went over those starting points for MAP1 and MAP2 on the previous slide. And on the x-axis is time in terms of treatment sessions. Again, that primary endpoint was uh, the change from baseline um, to 18 weeks. So looking at the differences here uh, from baseline, patients in the placebo plus therapy arm in the first study decreased by just under 14 points and just over 24 points in the MDMA AT arm. Uh, statistically significant difference here with a large effect size of 0 0.9 and a 12 point difference between the two arms. In MAP2, we saw pretty similar changes. Again, uh, moderate to severe PTSD patients CAPS-5 started at a little bit lower baseline. Difference was four, just over, just under 15 points for the placebo plus therapy arm uh, versus just under 24 points for the MDMA AT arm. Again, a difference of just under nine points, which again was considered to be statistically significant with an effect size of 0 0.7. And I'll note here that a 10 point difference in CAPS-5 was uh, considered to be clinically significant. So you'll see um, therapy certainly did benefit patients in both arms, both did decrease by at least 10 points from baseline. And next slide, please. Thank you so much. And this is the secondary endpoint that was captured during our clinical studies. It's the Sheehan Disability Scale. It looks at improvements in work, social, and school. That type of, uh, that type of question to see if patients are improving in their life. Uh, we didn't cross the clinically, minimally clinically important difference there, which is four points, but we did show statistically significant improvements in the MDMA-AT arm, so it was a positive endpoint. 
uh, differences of three points from baseline in the MDMA AT arm in MAP1 and 3.3 points from baseline in MAP2, a difference of around 1.1 to 1.2 versus that comparator of therapy alone plus placebo. And again, statistically significant there. So let's balance uh, efficacy with safety. Um, we did see a large number of adverse events, but most of those were mild to moderate in severity. I'll read off the ones that were greater than 20%, uh, which in MAP1 was nausea, decreased appetite, and muscle tightness. Uh, there were two participants in terms of serious adverse events uh, that reported a total of three SAEs. Um, in the placebo group, there were none in the MDMA AT arm in this particular study. Uh, and looking at adverse events of special interest, uh, we had three um, cases of suicidality in the MDMA AT arm and five in the placebo group. You see this in studies that look at patients who are approaching their core trauma. Uh, cardiac events that could indicate QT prolongation, we didn't see that in the MDMA arm. We had one patient in the placebo arm in this study and zero patients in either arm reporting misuse, abuse, or diversion. Next slide, please. So this is MAP2. Again, similar patient population, um, pretty similar adverse events seen in the studies at greater than 20% are feeling hot and cold, hyperhidrosis, decreased appetite, nausea, and muscle tightness. Uh, looking over at serious adverse events on the right-hand side here, uh, there were seven participants experiencing uh, treatment emergent adverse events. Um, almost all patients experienced at least one treatment emergent adverse event. However, none of these were considered serious and they were consistent with previous studies. We had two patients in each arm in this particular study uh, who reported suicidality and four that reported events that could indicate QT prolongation versus one in the placebo arm. And again, no patients reporting misuse, abuse, or diversion in either arm. So thank you so much for the clinical portion. I'm going to turn it over to John, my colleague, for this slide. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, just to round out our time here, uh, we wanted to give the board an idea of what our pathway towards commercial uh, commercialization and our product. Um, so really, our, our pathway is built around four major blocks here, provider education, access and reimbursement, site readiness, and patient support. Um, and really, as we look at each one of these, uh, there's a lot of analysis, there's a lot of action playing that we're doing, uh, but there's a lot of partnership like this board that we'd like to uh, begin with and continue as we go through this pathway. Uh, but to give you a little bit of detail of each one, our provider education is really this knowledge share of getting the healthcare system comfortable with knowledge, uh, whether it's clinical or operational knowledge, um, and also getting that back as well uh, to understand how do we get the healthcare system comfortable uh, with this treatment and facilitating that. Um, a big chunk here is going to be access and reimbursement too. Um, it's obviously getting payer coverage that's ideal for a majority of payer types, uh, but as well as making sure that from a distribution standpoint that this is done in a controlled, compliant, and closed manner, uh, given not just the stigma of the product, but just making sure that patient safety and making sure that their version is mitigated, if not zeroed out completely, um, but also looking at the, some of the financial burdens that might be hitting the system, whether it's the healthcare provider or even the patient via co-pays, we want to make sure that we set up a system that's ideal for access and reimbursement. Uh, that ties a little bit to site readiness as well. It's not just kind of moving the product to a site of care, but making sure that site of care is ideal for the patient. Uh, the patient safety as well as their experience in this treatment is going to be very, very important to us. Um, so not only do we look at the product moving through the system in a compliant manner, but making sure that it's ending up in a spot where therapy can happen uh, by someone that is trained and done in a way where the patient's experience is positive and therefore their treatment kind of journey is also positive as well. Uh, the last note here is going to be patient support. Um, it's not just kind of getting the drug to the patient, getting into the site of care that is ideal. It's also kind of doing a lot of hand holding with these patients. We're keeping in mind that these patients are going to be heavily invested. Um, we're thinking that a lot of these patients have tried and potentially failed other uh, conventional uh, treatment paths for their trauma, and that's why they're kind of pursuing a, a treatment like this. Uh, so keeping that in mind, we want to make sure that the patient's only concern is when they show up on their day of therapy uh, to do the work that they need to do uh, on themselves with their therapist, but all the other things that sort of guide them there, whether it's the drug being there, the co-pays, the, the insurance aspects, all of that is sort of offloaded or taken care of for them as much as possible. So we want to set up another arm of making sure that the patient is fully supported throughout their entire journey from scripts to actually 
uh, getting the treatment and completing the treatment cycle. Um, that said, I think that concludes our, our portion of uh, our presentation. Uh, happy to take questions, but thank you again for your time. Yes, board members, board staff questions. Please. So I just want to go back to the last slide so that I understand this. Um, is, is this like a like a like a medication and therapy package? So it, this is a different kind of therapy. That's why you're talking about reimbursement for the therapy. This is going to be a, a, a different um, approach to the therapy with the medication. So is that all of your, are you just doing the medication or are you doing this whole program? The, it will be the whole program on the reimbursement. We're trying to look at both access and reimbursement from a drug standpoint, uh, but also a therapy standpoint. I think what we're seeing is that this is the first time these are done at the same time. Um, and so that nuance and that novelty there is what we kind of need to dissect from an access and reimbursement standpoint. Will you be doing training on that or how does that, I mean, it sounds like it's, the, the practitioners or the providers will have to be trained in additional therapeutic approaches. And are you, is that all part of your program? That would be part of our program. I really like a few uh, comments to mention. Sure, I can add a little bit to that, if I may as well. We do plan on uh, therapists will need to be trained specifically in this modality before administering care. That's something we'll check on. We'll have a way of checking on that before it can be dispensed uh, in that setting. Um, we uh, are planning on offering training through our company. It's unsure and uncertain as to whether we'll be the only providers of that training as of now, but that we do uh, plan on providing training through our organization. And I would just add, um, this will be highly collaborative with the sites that are interested in being early adopters if we do get approval um, and making sure that the state, local, geographical levels and the actual healthcare systems that are interested in adopting and integrating this um, are working hand in hand with us in terms of credentialing and licensing and the training requirements for the therapy part. I had a question about the therapies used. Um, does it involve like um, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing therapies. Like, I know there's a, a long list of therapies. I'm very interested in PTSD. And then two were uh, the patients in the trial screen for like trials and failures of previous modalities. Um, like if they had cognitive therapy or if they've done like exposure therapy, that type of stuff. That's right. We did record whether patients had tried different modalities. Um, I don't know the exact information offhand, but most patients had tried either therapy or uh, drugs that do have an indication for PTSD previously. Um, in terms of, you're right, there are several different therapies that are considered, you know, first line uh, for PTSD, the CBT, PE, EMDR, uh, those sorts of things with different rankings based on who you're looking at, whether it's Veterans Affairs or other folks who are looking at uh, those therapies. So the patient, uh, therapists will need to be trained in the specific modality. Uh, it's an inner directed healing modality uh, when combined with our medication. Yeah, I was just wondering that because I'm having looked at this um, trial just um, with some people having similar, like if, you, if it's the medication or if it's just the ideal of therapy alone where some people will respond to therapy in this way, um, but it does look very interesting and and promising. So thank you for sharing. Are there any other questions or comments? Hi. Um, there were a couple of, uh, especially in the site readiness um, section, some some buzz, well, what I would consider a buzzword because I don't understand it. Um, so I just wanted to ask a, a couple more questions for um, further clarification. So um, you mentioned something about it in a closed manner. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say a closed manner? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from a distribution standpoint, we mean by a closed manner. So when we look at how distribution is done, as I'm sure the board knows, we're looking at DEA registered entities that can handle the drug compliantly, whether it's a schedule two or schedule three. So when we are looking at drug movement, we call it a closed manner in that sense where it's not, we don't anticipate this going outside of to a party other than the patient when it's dispensed. Um, but when the drug is moving from one point to another, we are looking at strictly DEA and registered entities that are proven 
you know, throughout their, their time as operators that they've done this before, they know how to handle it compliantly, as well as align with the state requirements too for scheduled products. So that's what we mean by a closed manner is that only DA registered entities would be handling the product. Okay. And then is this the sort of thing that would be administered kind of on the spot, or is this a medication that would be taken this? So this would not be a medication that would be taken outside of the clinic or the, the site that we're talking about. Um, it wouldn't like it's not a take home medication. So right. No, it is not. Okay. Yep. Um, and so then would the does the individual then kind of stay and get monitored for these possible adverse conditions? I'm happy to speak to that. So it's an eight hour therapy uh, session. And so there will be uh, our expectation is and this isn't written in stone yet, and this is still an ongoing negotiation, but our expectation is there will be a prescriber on site. Um, it will be in an office of some sort, um, and also a therapist will be on site. There may actually need to be a third person on site for this uh, treatment. It will be eight hours, and the clinic is required to hold the patient for longer if needed. And the patient will, we, we expect the patient will have to leave with another adult uh, that they know well that can take them home. Okay. So similar to Spravato evaluation monitoring after um, we're still in active negotiations with FDA on what the REMS program and label requirements will look like, and that will likely dictate additional medical policy for um, kind of. Gotcha. I, I'm a public member, so there may be some of these things that the rest of the board knows that I don't know. But um, and then I was wondering about the zeroed out completely. I, I wasn't familiar with that term either. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a, it's another buzzword uh, to use your phrase, but uh, what we're trying to look at is we are building our distribution design, knowing that diversion is going to be a major concern. Um, there's a stigma to our drug. I mean, uh, the board knows this. So, uh, that being said, diversion is one of our biggest mitigators, and my goal is to say, okay, how do we mitigate this or completely zero it out where diversion cannot happen, or there's a very very small chance that it can happen. So. As we look at these different sites, as we look at our distribution design and how much we can realize that design based on the FDA feedback uh, come August 11th, we'll have a very good idea of where those aspects are in our distribution where diversion has a 5% chance versus a 0% chance. And that's where we're gonna try to manage towards and say, what can we do via REMS, via the site of care, the pharmacies in place um, that can help us kind of make sure the diversion is not a major concern. Gotcha, yep. thank you. Sure. Just have a quick question in regards to um, early in the slide on your phase three study protocol overview. I sort of part of who you say you include are adult patients with long standing moderate to extreme PTSD. And then I just noticed uh, later on in your inclusion criteria, which is to moderate to severe PTSD. Are those interchangeable or that is those different? Uh, so typically extreme is considered the higher end of severe. Severe. Okay. So we didn't cut off at the end of severe, we went all the way up. If you had a full score on the caps, you were still eligible for our trials. Yeah. So in that inclusion severe, that would include that extreme severe. That, that's gotcha. correct. Okay. That's correct. I'll just make a quick comment of, I appreciate that incorporating the therapy aspect or kind of that dual mode, um, with it, so that is nice to see that innovation there. Um, is there any? Um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, would the therapy be extended past the three sessions at all, or kind of that would be the uh, cap? And apologies if you mentioned that. So, uh, thank you for the question. Part of that will be really fleshed out in the real world, um, based on kind of. Insurance policy language, um, prior authorization, reauthorization, and then ongoing care for that patient. Um, so there's an aspect of perhaps if they already have a therapist that they're using for talk therapy outside of this acute treatment. Um, so still some things that are unknown in terms of what this will look like outside of a, a rigid clinical trial setting, uh, but. The longer term kind of integration is is how it's discussed right now, and and that touches on the idea of ongoing support with 
some form of therapy or, or clinician. Was there a special DEA registration that would be required? Or is it a just typical DEA registration requirement, or will there be something? Yes. Yeah. yeah, uh, we think it's not going to, there isn't a special DEA requirement right now, from what we understand, as long as it's a controlled substance. I think when we look at our entities and look at their registration and licensing, we just have to make sure that the licensing incorporates a C2 or C3 or C1 through C5. I think that's the only thing that we'll check. Um, anything beyond that is sort of open to possibility, depending on where the DEA scheduling comes in, um, as well as uh, some of the other legislative aspects that may prohibit some of our ability to kind of create the distribution system. So in terms of DEA, we don't think there's anything special unless obviously if they tell us. Can, can I, yeah, and just keep also in mind that uh, pharmacies who handle this medication, for example, will have to be enrolled in REMS as well as the healthcare clinic. So while not a special DEA number or license, and I, I do know what you're referring to, like a buprenorphine type of thing, but um, it'll have to be enrolled in REMS and only those who are enrolled in REMS will be able to order products. Just to note, I don't know if we touched on this completely, but the treatment cycle for this acute treatment, um, the prescription is dispensed per session per patient. So this isn't uh, a 30-day supply. And even in terms of the supply that's on hand um, on site uh, is going to be triggered by that prescription for that patient's drug administration session um, for that eight-hour day. Um, and there are three different cycles of that. So if you are patient X, um, your prescription will then that next session will have to be kind of triggered for the whole cycle per treatment day. Adding on to that just a, a little bit, it's single dose in tamper resistant packaging that's specially made uh, for the do for that dosing day. So patient will know if it's been tampered with, the, the physician will know if it's been tampered with. And again, it's just one or two capsules to make that either 120 or 180 milligram total dose. Are you able to comment at all on anticipated cost of treatment? So we are currently working on price um, and over the next month, we'll have more information. Um, there are a lot of sensitivities around the REMS negotiation and other things that um, could dictate how this is delivered or where that will impact price. And those are all kind of considerations that are currently being evaluated. But in the, the coming weeks, we should have a better idea. And I'll just add, just in case it, um, this hasn't been said before, but we're a public benefit corporation. Um, and so we do balance patient access with shareholder profits and that's um, found in our founding documents and extremely important to us as well. Thank you very much um, representatives from, from Lycos. This was very helpful and informative. We appreciate you, you attending and, and presenting on this topic. Um, for board members, again, this was informational today. Um, no action is required. Um, staff will continue to continue to monitor the status of, of all of this and, and we'll address rescheduling when that time comes. So, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, it sounds for the, um, I can I, 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 answer that. Um, so that kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier in terms of um, retreatment in the real world will be something that we work through with um, kind of standards of care and clinicians and insurers as well in terms of reauthorization. And I'll note in our phase, I'm sorry about that, in our phase three studies, no patients had more than three sessions. So if, if reimbursement's based on our phase three trials, um, I would, my expectation as just being a practitioner and knowing how this works um, is that at least in the, in terms of one year, you know, who, who knows beyond that when patients switch insurances and that sort of thing, but um, patients didn't have more than three sessions in our phase three studies. Thank you. Appreciate you addressing that question. Okay. Thanks again. And to those attending virtually, I don't know why the screen looks black. I don't know if, if it's like that way for you, but I don't want to fiddle around and, and accidentally turn the whole thing off. So I apologize if you can't see us. And I, I don't know what to make of it. 
All right, next up on the agenda is the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance. Um, we have Rachel Root. Um, and again, I wanted to thank the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance and technicians for um, working on this document. Um, again, we're looking at change management here and there are a lot of changes in here. Um, we, we respectfully asked to when we're looking at things, um, maybe to facilitate dialogue a little bit better, kind of understanding or putting comments behind the rationale, because we want to work through like um, some issues that um, maybe are in statute and um, those that aren't. Um, again, um, we all know that we definitely do need change, so I applaud your efforts. I won't talk anymore and I will just turn the microphone over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm a pharmacist and as mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance. And just to provide a bit of background, um, this is a priority area for the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance. Um, we spoke at a previous meeting kind of talking about the mission of this group. Um, and this group really feels like taking a look at pharmacy technician rules and regulations would offer us an opportunity to better take care of patients in the end. So to do that, a work group was formed that included pharmacists and technicians in different practice settings in different areas of the state. And they met along with MPA over the course of almost two years to talk about the current rules and regulations and then to look outside as far as what other states are doing and then looking to the literature as well. Um, so the kind of culmination of what you see with that is the companion uh, document that's being displayed. Um, and you'll see some of the big summary um, changes at the top, um, the draft uh, change in the language after that, and then some references included at the bottom. Um, the last thing I, I wanted to say um, is I know some of this language is polarizing. Um, I, working with this work group, working with MPA, presenting on this topic to multiple groups, I know there are strong opinions on several of these or um, that you will see listed here. And I think as we're working through wanting to implement changes, the Board of Pharmacy was obviously recognized as someone we would really want to partner with and get feedback from as we look to make changes to the rules and regulations. Um, so with that, I'm happy to just open it up broadly or if we wanted to take um, some of the bigger proposals section by section, I'm open to what, what the um, group feels would be the best approach. Board members, any preferences? Section by section. Section by section, okay. Well then I'll just start with the big summary proposals. If you're looking at the language, You'll notice smaller changes, but these are really the ones we wanted to call out as some of the big changes. Um, the first one is eliminating pharmacy technician ratios. So I'm going to pause there for feedback. Rationale. Um, the rationale. So looking at trends across the United States, there's definitely a trend towards loosening or removing ratios. And that was definitely a part of the discussion, a lot of heavy discussion on do we loosen the ratios? Do we eliminate the ratios? Um, and looking at um, some of the Minnesota Pharmacy Legislative Day feedback in the literature, we really could not find anything to show that states that don't have ratios um, have worse outcomes or patient safety is at risk. Um, so looking to provide the opportunity for sites to determine you know, what makes the most sense for their site, we felt like that would give the broadest range. And when we were reading different articles in literature, you'll see some of them cited at the, the end. Um, really was a proponent of that. So that's where that originated. Didn't kind of going off of Robbie's, it, is there a specific problem that you're trying to correct by eliminating the tech ratio? Yeah, that's a great question. I think some of um, what I've heard and talking to different groups um, is really trying to have more flexibility. So being limited in what can be included or whatnot. Um, I think we've seen advances in technology and we've seen some of those changes from the board as far as related to barcoding technology. But as we continue to advance, um, that's one piece and um, it takes time to change rules to allow for some of that. Also, we're seeing changes in recruitment as far as difficulty in recruiting technicians, um, having a career ladder for them to try to keep and retain them in the profession has been a challenge. And then also we're seeing trends with decreasing pharmacy school enrollment um, and knowing we have um, capable technicians who can take on responsibilities or um, be affected with the ratios, um, trying to get ahead of some of those trends that we see coming down the pipe. 
Um, so, this is Kendra. Oh, sorry to. Um, what states currently have opened um, it up? I know that there's uh, multiple, but I just wasn't sure if you were um, had those listed. Yeah, um, I do have those um, in the packet that was provided. You can see the presentation from from the last. There is a, a map. I can share my screen if that's preferred. Oh, is it up? Um, I'm trying to see. If you keep going, there's another map of the United States, that one. Yeah, so that's 2023. So just know that there may have been changes since this map was put together. But to orient you, the red you can see is the smallest ratio at one to two, orange is one to three, yellow one to four, green one to six, and the gray is none. Um, and talking to national professional organizations, this is a trend um, that we've seen and COVID certainly expedited that, um, but even before there was a trend towards loosening or eliminating ratios. Um, I'll also note um, to your question about other things that we've seen, um, some of our um, pharmacists that we've talked to that practice in neighboring states as well as in Minnesota have seen when they compare um, things like immunization rates or MTM services offered by um, allowing some expansion of that ratios. Um, it's allowed for expanded patient care services as well. On uh, some, so just let me summarize real quick. Sort of the problems that you had mentioned was flexibility with tech technology, hoping that we'd have more flexibility with that. Mm -hmm. um, increasing recruitment and career options for technicians. And then helping with pharmacy school enrollment as as dropping, I I have a hard time with this, and I just want to be forthcoming is that I I don't see how taking that technician or ratio away addresses those problems. How do we improve school enrollment by taking a tech ratio away? I, I that just doesn't I don't quite get that connection on that one. Recruitment and career. I would argue, I think there's other ways that we could by by not just doing that that I would be happy with. Um, and maybe flexibility with technology, I can understand that a little bit. That's where I'm at. Yeah, that's that's fair, Ben. Thank you for pointing that out. I think some of that bleeds into the next bullet. So I'm probably getting a little bit of ahead of myself. Can um, I can I ask a question? Um, it looks like just for me in those states that have those, they seem to have had a heart of significant number of pharmacy closings. Is, is that also been a consideration as to why, where you have a number of pharmacies that have closed, you don't have pharmacists that are st staffed, you talk about recruitment and retention, are those some of the driving forces yeah, in I, this too? Yeah, I think it definitely could be. Um, I didn't see anything in the literature that we pulled so more anecdotally. I think there's evidence to support that or um, opinions to support that, but I didn't necessarily see that in some of the literature that we looked at. I know there is a map from the University of Pittsburgh that they recently put out where they went by time lapse of uh, kind of, it, it's like, a, I, I'm dating myself here, a reverse light bright, um, where it's not a pretty picture where they go by time and they show across the nation, the numbers of pharmacies that have closed. So it might be something that you and everybody want, would want to take a look at, but it is available online and free. One more, hopefully quick question. Um, in those states that have, let's say, no limits, it's not like they're flip flop to 15 to 1 or anything like that. Uh, do we have like an average of what pharmacies kind of level out at, um, you know, for a for an average or does it range? And maybe that info isn't available either. Sorry. Yeah, I can I can speak of one example. So talking to colleagues that have practiced in Wisconsin who have broader ratios that they tend to average out around four to five. So um, I think there's definitely a fear of, you know, you know, 20, 30, I don't know what pick your number of technicians. Um, but in talking to individuals and in some that have worked in some of those states, they haven't seen that trend. Now, if others have evidence to refute that, I'm happy to take that information. Somebody see the question on board? Sarah? 
Um, I can read it. Sarah said, with the recruitment of pharmacy enrollment rates, I think that my understanding is pharmacies may need additional technicians in the future to help uh, work, help the workforce um, in pharmacy. Hi, uh, board surveyor. Um, often we're the eyes and ears of the board mm -hmm. for many issues that um, come up. Uh, my experience or what I hear most when I'm out at community pharmacies is their concern with the environment with the focus on metrics and quotas. And I see a concern for a potential now that especially now that we've passed some legislation allowing technicians to immunize and with this proposal of unlimited techs, no direct supervision, that there will be an environment and focus on more metrics mm -hmm. quotas, which is very concerning for a lot of our pharmacists out there working in chain pharmacies? Yeah, I think that's a good question to pose. Um, and I certainly have talked with, I don't practice um, in either of those settings, but talking to individuals that do, I think there's some that have, have that concern and others that have said um, kind of the opposite of, well, when we've implemented this in other states, we haven't seen that explosion, but I do think it's a fair thing to point out. Right, because I've, I've never heard the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> concerns. Right. Um, and especially I know there was legislation that was introduced this session about metrics and quotas. And I think that's really what pharmacists are a lot of them that I speak to yeah. are concerned about. And I saw that it didn't really move forward. I know some states have that um, California, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to this group's um, thoughts on that? Or is that something you support? legislation going forward about metrics and quotas for pharmacies and that, for that workplace. Yeah, so our work group hasn't talked about that specifically, but I'm happy to bring that back to MPA and have a further discussion on that. I know in regards to technician ratios, it definitely came up um, as far as where are the limits. Um, and there was healthy debate even within MPA about you know what that effect would be. Um, and I think ultimately at the end, looking at for consensus from that group was just wanting to provide that opportunity and that flexibility to be able to best meet patient care. But I will certainly take that back. Hey, Rachel, one comment, maybe, um, I don't know if it's possible here or at a future meeting, maybe to discuss who was part of that work group and what their settings were. You know, I think it would be go off an extreme example. Um, I could sit in a room and talk about something I know very little about and take an opinion um, versus having a group that's well comprised of, you know, I can play a great devil's advocate, you know. So just understanding the the makeup of, you know, who who drafted this, who proposed it, what settings are they in, what um, practice history do they have? Um, sometimes that will provide some more intelligence to a group you're informing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I can speak broadly um, before I would give individual names. I'd want to check with them first. Um, but the group was pretty close to a 50-50 split of pharmacists and technicians. Um, about 60% of the group practiced in a health system. So that would include an inpatient setting, outpatient setting. Um, and then the last about quarter of the group primarily practiced in an outpatient retail setting. And then maybe 5% in kind of an other category. One more question about MPA. Were you uh, part of the group that was involved in increasing the number of uh, uh, the ratio in the past? No, I was not involved in that. Oh, group. MPA. Oh, MPA. So MPA has a, um, a long history and it's changed its name a few different times in the makeup, but some of the earlier, um, I guess, where MPA was born out of was from that group. It was a, a task force at the time, but a lot of those members stayed on as it transitioned into MPA. That answers your question, Rubia. Yeah. Is any other comments for technician ratios? Otherwise, I'd go to the next. I have one comment. I just want to point out to the members and the public that that data that's on that screen from NABP Survey of Pharmacy Law, <clears throat> excuse me, will have some disclaimers and footnotes as well. So you'd want to take that into consideration when you look at that map 
that those gray areas potentially have additional footnotes or conditions by that board in survey of pharmacy law. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Amy. Minnesota is a great example of that, where we do have some variation and even in our own ratio. So maybe I'll just, because we're kind of talking about this te technician ratio. So some of your proposed changes, um, you know, number two and number four, I think makes sense. Those are just good ways to help increase this. Uh, when I look at number one and, and three, um, what I'm thinking about from a board perspective is how do we minimize risk if we were to adopt these or to go forward with that? Um, and I'm not, I, when I go through this, I'm not seeing that explicitly addressed in these and that's what gives me pause. So example that was brought up um, is the, uh, you know, the metric numbers. When, when I see something like this, uh, increasing the ratio or, or removing it, I would like to see a minimization of the risk with this coupled by removing metrics from the state of Minnesota. If we want more technicians, we also need to make sure what risks are we including in that and how do we address that risk? Um, you know, when you're decreasing the age from 18 to 16, yes, we are opening that applicant pool and we're gonna get more applicants, but we're also gonna get, get more good and bad applicants. So we're just saying, all right, maybe age isn't a great way to determine who can do this. But if we're taking that out, how do we determine now with this larger pool of applicants who is going to be good to become a pharmacy technician? Because it, then it just, well, we're just, we're opening sort of the bottom end of the applicant pool. We're now taking a barrier away. It's just good because it opens it up, but then how do we minimize the risk of opening that up further to, to more people on there? Um, as I was just, Going, I, I just basically just tried, tried to search because in a lot of these documents, it talks about, hey, it, we find in these states that it doesn't increase errors. And it's a really focus on the medication error in specific events, which, which, which is fine. So I was just going through and trying to find, hey, when were these published? What information is out there? Uh, there seems to be a group of data that came out in the early 2000s, some data that came out around 2010, 2014, and then some now post COVID. And I would say, I would agree that most, most of the evidence is either supporting removal of technician, or they say, we don't have enough info to actually determine, like we would want to study this more. And that seems to follow with each kind of grouping of studies that, that come out. Kind of the common thing though, with lots of them, or as they, repeatedly say the number one factor that greatly increases risk of drug medication and errors was increased workload. And so the studies that support removing technician ratios focuses more on actual errors. The studies that say, hey, we need more are focusing more on workload. So that gets me to thinking, you know, when we think about a workload within a pharmacy, everything runs through the pharmacist. So if we're allowing our technicians to do more work, ultimately that has to run through a pharmacist. So that's sort of like the stopgap, that's the linchpin. So uh, there is, we are increasing the workload. How do we minimize the risk of increasing that workload on that pharmacist at that time? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know, is it just, if we have not had enough time to catch errors, are we not looking at correct errors? Um, some of the footnotes and some some of the studies uh, that'll don't worry about that. That was my own opinion. I didn't really like some of those footnotes. I thought they did not have a lot of good data. But it just comes back to minimizing risk. And so I, I see these changes that that we're proposing, but I don't quite see with how do we minimize risk then that is involved with making those changes. Yeah, can I ask a clarifying question sure. towards that? So taking um, age, for example, in addition to background checks and training programs, are there other things that you see would help to minimize that risk? Yeah, um, that is a good question. Um, I don't have anything right off the top of my head. And I would say that just got me thinking as so if we're not using age, you know, we, we use age as we say 18, they are becoming an adult, right? They can have, you know, we hope that they have um, more life experience. So 
do we need something that needs to show us that if someone is 16, that they have that same level that we would expect from someone from an 18? How, so if I was thinking about something, I would need to think about how do I identify someone who is 16 that meets what we think we need from someone who is 18? Okay. That's how I'd approach it. I don't have a good way yet, but that's how I was thinking about it. I know some states have instituted a separate designation if you're if you're 16 to 18. Sure. I don't know if that gets that kind of yeah. No, I, I think that would be totally. You know, 16 to 18. Maybe you're doing this. You know, on here you have definitions of maybe you can't have an advanced. Uh, sorry, where were these? And, and, the, and you, so maybe you can't sit to get your advanced certification until you're 18. You could do, maybe you could do so, something other than that, more of that dispensing filling role, but then to complete some of these more advanced levels to get your advanced practice, your certification, maybe you would need to be 18. That's good feedback. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, just a question on that age too. I don't know if this is probably for the group, but do we know what prompted the change from 16 to 18 back in looks like 2012. Do we know what what the cause for that was, Michelle? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it was because they, they were <clears throat> hoping to do what you're saying. So increase <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Increasing the age from 16 to 18 and then doing some rules related to technicians and different allowances. Mm -hmm. So this is almost a backwards thought. Obviously, different people probably came up with it than what was proposed back at that time. Yeah, and I can say for the work group, it was kind of tying back to trying to recruit a bigger pool of candidates. And a lot of people that I talked through um, when I've given presentations will come up to me afterwards and say, I got into pharmacy when I was 16, and I'm not sure I would have chosen pharmacy if I wouldn't have had that. I was kind of surprised how many people told me that. Um, so kind of just looking to both for technician, and then that's also a feeder into our pharmacy schools as well, um, of trying to increase engagement in the profession as well. Is there evidence that that's a standard pattern? Um, could you clarify what, what well, you're talking about? I wouldn't be interested if I had started at 16. Is there a, is there evidence that that actually brings more people into pharmacy school? Or? Yeah, that's a good um, question, James. That was more anecdotal, I will say. But certainly, if we're looking at data on pharmacy school admissions um, or number of applicants, that has decreased significantly. And I, I know there's some maybe people that are closer to the College of Pharmacy that could give more specific data on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm asking because when you started out, it seemed to me that you you posed a problem that I'm still waiting for for a solution to, which is we don't have enough pharmacists and we can't hire techs. So I don't understand how we resolve a workforce problem that has workforce shortages in both places by changing the organizational management and pay structure of pharmacy. Yeah. I'm not getting it, so. And I'll jump in just yeah. a sec here. Yeah, um, I just actually wanted to uh, hear a bit more of like um, your rationale for those kind of tiered of the different technicians and also lowering the age. I like the innovation of, um, you know, I think of those high school kids that are doing college classes and maybe they graduate high school already a CNA. Like, is that something that we can uh, interest them in pharmacy uh, at a younger age before they get plugged into, I don't want to say another, another type of profession, but we can be uh, gauging their interest and in whether they go on to pharmacy school beyond a technician. I started as a pharmacy technician and um, at that time had no idea what I was getting into, but then ended up loving it. Uh, so a bit more rationale, I guess, on maybe the ideas of, you know, getting or uh, gauging interest in pharmacy at a younger age and then those tiers and how they might um, go together. Thanks, Kendra. I don't know if you had a question for me in there. So if I missed it, um, please let Not me know. Not really a question, more just you explaining 
uh, rationale maybe for, for those ideas or where they come from. Thank you. Yes, then the other area is just advanced technician responsibilities, bullet number two, if there was any additional feedback on, on that one. The outline doesn't um, specify what those advanced responsibilities, but if you read further in the document, um, it seems to be uh, taking um, some pharmacist duties and assigning them to technicians such as uh, MedRec or uh, prescription transfer. Um, so could you uh, could you elaborate on those? Yeah, so and that's a good point, Rubia. So um, mostly you'll see that in the definitions, adding the advanced pharmacy technician definition as well as the technician product verification and medication history. Um, so giving some inclination there um, as far as what some of those responsibilities would include. So for example, in the advanced pharmacy technician, we do call out medication history collection um, and immunizations as a couple examples of that. Um, part of that was also born out of what we were seeing from trends from other states and hearing from other national organizations, seeing trends and in involving technicians in more of those responsibilities um, and kind of paired along with that. Um, allowing the pharmacist to focus on, uh, focus on other tasks that are solely permissible for pharmacists alone. I don't know if that answers your question, what you were getting at, though, Rivia. I wanted to, to elaborate on that. The types of advanced responsibilities. Yeah, so I think um, looking at, you know, what's allowed, I think we do have some variances that allow technician product verification. So that would really just be moving that into um, regulation and rule to be able to do that. And then some of the other, you know, we talked about immunization, which we have seen that change legislatively um, more recently. And then for other advanced duties, I think it would tie back to the training and what are they trained to do? So you couldn't just be a certified technician doing some of those advanced um, duties. You would still need the appropriate training in order to be able to take some of those duties on. Um, I think that's certainly an area for discussion as far as what types of duties we would want to include um, for technicians to be able to do. But those were the couple that we had focused on, at least initially. If you have thoughts for others, I'm happy to hear those two. Just a suggestion. Um, I've known, I've seen them at conferences and whatever. When you're presenting this, it would be really great if you had like a list of all the states and a checkbox to what they allow, like ratios or technician things so that we're not having to jump around. I think um, I think the NABP probably has Dude, that. Yeah, the NABP um, does provide that, but I'm happy to so, share that. Yeah, I think that would allow um, people to kind of see things a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Uh, and I know we're kind of rapidly, I know this is a, a very interesting topic. I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the last bullet point, and then um, yeah, I'll I'll have a few comments. Um, so really, then just the last bullet point um, was um, carried more out of strife and talking to individuals in the re registration renewal deadlines. Just being a challenge with it being in December, um, July was picked because just looked at a map of when other things were due um, and picked July because it seemed like there would be less conflicts, but certainly we look to, to board staff to confirm or deny that. But just to move that out from the end of the year when there's a lot of other activities going on, um, people are out of office, both pharmacists and technicians, as well as um, you know part of the board might be closed during that time. So could we just move that up earlier in the year to avoid some of the scrambling that happens at the end of the year? Yeah, and I wanted to turn this over to my um, colleague here so that she can provide some insight into that. Um, so regarding timing, I think that this is a good item to discuss and really figure out. I think July would be challenging and just kind of hearing that it was maybe just chosen, not necessarily arbitrarily, but we weren't dead set on July. Um, we're, this is a really challenging time of year for board staff in terms of renewals we're getting. Uh, manufacturers, wholesalers, and pharmacies through. So then to just on the cusps of that open tech renewal probably wouldn't be the best timing, but perhaps September, October. I mean, I do think that there's an opportunity to meet in the middle and, and find some common ground. Definitely. Flexible. Would a viable solution be just open the tech registration up earlier? That is an option. They can do it sooner than in December if they're busy. 
Yeah, and so for all of our, right, as, as people are aware, we, we migrated to this new system online and um, we opened the renewal process up for, for anybody, so technicians, pharmacies, you name it, 60 days prior to the expiration of that license or registration. And so um, that's kind of been the standard that, that we've adopted, um, but can certainly look. I think we've also seen when the deadline is December 31st, um, we have a population that will wait till the deadline. So I think if we moved the deadline up, it would motivate people to meet a sooner deadline right. for our procrastinators and accounting for them. I think also, um, but, but, um, I think this is an area because I asked Katrina to kind of comment so that we can educate people here mm -hmm. in terms of what happens with that timeline. So if you wanted to kind of talk about like what you need to do, um, how long you have to respond to certain things, sure. that, that's an area of opportunity for us to discuss because it's not like the tabs. Yeah, right. And so I think in a, an ideal situation, um, technicians would have that open period and let's say it's just all of month of November. So November, everybody has to upload and submit their renewals by December 1st. And then effective December 1st, that gives staff the full month to really review and send deficiency notices if something's missing or um, you name it. Staff are vetting like the veracity of the renewal, right, before approving it. So if we could have time on both sides, I think that would benefit both parties. It's good to hear. I wanted to know what what is the there is no voting today on this issue. What what is your plan to go forward with this, and what what are the steps you're going to go through after this? Yeah, I think that's something um, you know MPA hasn't done a lot of work in updating or proposing updated rules and regulations. So I think part of it is looking for guidance or, or advice from the board to do that. Um, but for today was to gather information since we've never really held an open forum to talk to the board about that take that feedback um, and perhaps make some tweaks and revisions and then certainly open to feedback from board or board leadership on you know, what you'd recommend as MP is moving forward. Jim, go ahead. I, I have one more comment to make. Um, I was here in, uh, for the board discussion and the whole deal about uh, increasing uh, pharmacy tech ratio in the past. and. Uh, uh, the board's focus is public safety. So when we discussed it and with the input from uh, the inspectors and um, we, we had, we had uh, a set uh, tech ratio and we had a good compromise, um, which we, rep we proposed. The group then that you said the MPA was, was part of then went over our heads to the legislature and got a law passed to change the, the tech ratio where our input was not taken. Um, I would hope this would not happen uh, for public safety purposes. Uh, again, where the, it would be um, all the discussion that we are making would be discarded in, uh, for business purposes rather than uh, Public safety purposes. Thank you for calling that out, Rupia. I, I, the conversations I've been involved in with MPA, is MPA would very much like to partner with the board as much as possible, knowing the board has limits on who they can interact with from an external standpoint. But I think the ideal state would be able to be able to partner. Um, but we, we'll kind of have to see, I think, how it progresses too. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to work together and find um, language that would work for all parties. Um, but it's a tricky topic, I don't. So I think as much as we can partner, that would be ideal. All right, I have a few comments um, before we move on. So first of all, thank you so much for um, gathering this information. My ask just personally is to like prioritize what would be the biggest win for you. This is a lot of change. Some of it's very radical. We do need change um, in the practice of pharmacy right now, because again, I would argue also because when we can't service our consumers or our patients, that is a patient safety issue. Um, just looking at that tech ratio thing, if there was maybe a compromise where like, hey, it's very radical to get rid of ratios altogether, would you possibly consider increasing it by one or two so that we can evaluate over a period of time? 
Um, and then just again, um, with some of those tech duties, just kind of being more clear. Um, we are seeing changes all across the country um, in terms of how pharmacy is being practiced. So um, I, I, again, I, I thank you for your intellectual humility and being here and willing to take on a very um, tough topic. Um, are there any other comments or anything that I can solicit before we move on to the next agenda? And thank you so much for, for doing what you're doing. Really appreciate it. I just have one additional I, a concern with this, the tech product verification and that piece. I feel like we've really moved a lot. What I have seen is a lot of pharmacies have moved to central fill. So there is a lot of that product verification already moved out of the busyness of the pharmacy. So a lot are utilizing central fill. We actually don't have any variances for tech verification. So I don't that we don't do anymore. That when that is allowed, it's based on a, a fail safe barcode system where that patient has been in the hospital, they're having it, it's barcode scanned, it's barcode scanned before that patient's administered. That's not happening in the community setting where they wouldn't have that. Um, and it just having um, what's concerning when I see that product verification is also the language in here about removing a pharmacist from supervising. Mm -hmm. And I've seen comments and articles about is that this potential, is that what we're moving to is that there is not a pharmacist in the pharmacy. And then how does that affect access for our patients in having that healthcare provider readily available in the community? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question just to comment on that. And I know that's something MPA is looking at too, is that proximity or through the pandemic, we made a lot of changes and it was kind of a quick test of what we saw. So I think that's something they'll be continuing to work on, but I appreciate that feedback. I'll take note of that. One, uh, other, one other item I was going to share for feedback, um, and I'm sorry for those that were trying to watch on the screen, I was scrolling and trying to find it, for the persons not included, um, However, you know, the outcome with it tiering technicians, but just recognizing that there are staff in a pharmacy that um, are performing non-technician or non-pharmacist roles. And so just if there's compromise to increase the ratio to whatever that number might be to um, maybe try to better define the language for um, some of the clerical duties that wouldn't fall under the responsibilities of a tech or a pharmacist. Thank you for the time and for the feedback on behalf of MPA. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll just keep this short because my colleague is not here. Uh, Barbara Klein is not here today, but I did have the opportunity to attend the NABP annual meeting in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, it was a wonderful experience to be able to connect with people from all over across the nation and then in full transparency, um, Walgreens um, did allow people to uh, tour their facility, um, their central fill facility. I was very impressed by the technology. Again, when we're talking about some of these um, changes to tech duties, I think we do have to consider like AI and innovation. Um, we're gonna be probably behind the eight ball when we look at how rapidly technology is gonna be implemented to affect the practice of pharmacy. But again, um, had the opportunity to vote, represent the state of Minnesota. Thank you all for allowing me to do that as your president. And so um, nothing else remarkable to report. Um, and then moving on to the next agenda item, it's just the district uh, five meeting is going to be held July 31st to August 2nd. We're still in the process of trying to finalize what um, and who will be attending, but I'm happy to announce that Katrina will be attending. Um, uh, along with myself, and so we are looking for other people to attend as well. Um, please email um, Jill, Katrina, myself, or the rest of the board if you're looking at attending, and we'd love to have you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the next item is a little bit heavier, and I think what I want to go ahead. Sorry. I think it's five minutes, five minute break. I would love, especially for this next part, to be Ab absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, 
We will resume at 1123. If I, well, Patty's in the corner there. I don't want to use it too much because then I'll just want to. Um, <laughs> oh, I mean, I think I've, we're, we're carving out a new legacy here, which kind of brings our, our next moment here. And I think it's important, one, um, that we acknowledge all the presenters here today. It can be very challenging. You have a group that loves to ask a lot of questions. Um, and again, just um, kind of bringing some things into the new and to the forefront. And so um, thank you also for being respectful of those time limitations. Um, you guys passed the vibe check, as what my kids would say, and um, we appreciate that. But with that being said, if you know me, um, I was sharing during the break here about how I became a pharmacist. So I, I, I would like to be um, to do that before we go into this next moment. Um, I became a pharmacist because at the age of five, I saw an African-American male pharmacist in my community who stopped um, my mom from getting penicillin um, when she had a severe penicillin allergy and that changed my life um, significantly so sometimes it's not 16 isn't the magic age but we want to make sure that we make pharmacists available and um, in community and so you also know me i i think it's important that we honor people who have come before us um, i certainly would not be in this role and on this board if it weren't for these first two women um, that I'm going to talk about. And um, the first woman is Patty uh, or Patricia Bellino. Um, she passed away on June 4th of 2024, um, surrounded by her family members and hospice nurses. Patty attended the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy and graduated in June of 1997 with a degree. After getting a degree, Patty worked at pharmacies that included Lake Elmo, South St. Paul Kmart, and Dahl Pharmacy. In 1998, Patty was a historic a person. She made history. Um, she was hired by the Minnesota State Board of Pharmacy to be a state um, inspector surveyor of pharmacies and worked for 10 years. She's remarkable because she was the first female inspector hired by the board and let that sit in. In 1988, she was the first female um, inspector. Um, my heartfelt thoughts to um, Patty's family member, the community, um, the people that she served, she certainly will be missed. Um, thank you for allowing me to share that. And I just ask that we sit here for at least a minute and we kind of reflect on her contributions and honor her family and friends. All right, um, the next person I would like to honor is De Denise uh, Marie Frank. Um, Denise um, passed away on May 21st, um, 2024. Um, I will be transparent. Denise is part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, Denise was a mentor to me um, as um, she was on the Minnesota Pharmacy Alumni Society, but her passion and her commitment for challenging and breaking boundaries um, and encouraging people is was certainly unmatched. Um, Denise uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy in 1984. Um, after college, she worked as a hospital pharmacist, a retail pharmacist, and eventually owning her own store with her father. Again, another history maker, and she, she is a, the reason why I'm here. She was the youngest female um, appointed to the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy in 1991. Um, please um, accept my personal condolences to the family and friends in the community. Denise certainly will be missed. Um, thank you for allowing me to share that. And I ask that we sit here in just in a minute of silence while we honor her um, contributions. Thank you. 
please mute your um, computers and phone. That would be so greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing me to um, share those moments. I do encourage people, if you do have announcements or contributions, we do want to take that time to honor that. So please do email me or um, the board in general. We do want to get those items on the agenda. Um, so next, I would like to turn this over to uh, Lindsay Franklin, who will provide the legislative update. As big as it gets. Okay, cool. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Franklin. I am the legislative liaison for all of the health licensing boards, including the Board of Pharmacy. So I have 18 um, boards in my portfolio, and as a result, 18 lovely bosses. Um, Jill, Jill being one of them. Yes, I'm very lucky. Um, and I started actually six months ago today. I started in December. This is a new role to the boards. There wasn't previously anybody in my position. You all were just on your own and poor Jill and Katrina were left tracking legislative changes on their own. And um, as I have quickly learned, um, there are many things that happen to the Board of Pharmacy um, that are not necessarily vetted um, before they're, you know, they come out in a bill. So it was a really interesting session. Um, Want to start out just giving you all a little bit of uh, background about myself. So um, I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest. I moved here just a couple months before I started here at the boards. Um, I've worked in policy for over 10 years. I've mostly worked in employment related things, representing workers, I'm a worker advocate first and foremost. Um, and that uh, lend itself nicely to the kind of work that the boards do, um, dealing with professionals and workers. Um, previously, I was a lobbyist for the Oregon AFL CIO, where I represented 55 labor unions in a variety of different industries, so teachers and building trades. And as you can imagine, much like the boards, they have their own set of priorities and interests um, that you have to balance. So it was, I think, really helpful to have that experience before coming coming over here. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in political science and a JD um, and have, like I said, worked in law and policy for quite a long time. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about some things that happened this year or were going to happen this year and didn't in in the case of a couple of things. Oh, and first, before I actually start, I need to give a huge shout out to Katrina, to Jill, and to Brock Reed. Um, without the three of them, I would not be able to do my job because I am a lawyer by trade. I am not a pharmacist. And so um, the three of them held my hand, walking me step by step through some of the things people are doing um, and do every day out in the community, which has been a huge help. And now, and Buck as well, I'm gonna give a shout out to, to Buck Humphrey, who's been a huge help. Um, really just getting me up to speed with all things pharmacy related and on the licensing side. So you have great staff. Um, we're going to start with the prohibition of quotas and chain pharmacies. Um, I know in the last uh, legislative update that Jill gave you all that this hadn't moved, it still didn't end up moving. Um, while there, there are policy deadlines, the legislature can make different rules. So I wanted to just go ahead and run this out. Um, we can talk later in the year about whether or not it makes sense to bring something like this back or how to partner with folks doing this work. Um, same with the End of Life Option Act. This bill did not end up um, moving forward. Um, there's still significant opposition in the Senate, but I don't expect to shift any time soon, at least not until an election happens. So um, I doubt this will move forward in the next biennium, but it will probably be brought back. It's been brought back in every biennium, I think, for the last five or six. So. Um, it's not going away anytime soon, and I assume at some point it will become law in the state. Um, how long that takes, I think, is the question. Um, the pharmacist authority expansion, so this is to do with the lab tests. Um, it permits the pharmacist to initiate and order and administer vaccines. Um, the big change that happened between the last time that you all met and now is that there was some language added in relation to House File 2466. Um, so into 1197, which was then rolled into an omnibus. Um, but really what it allows uh, pharmacists to do um, is prescribe, dispense, and administer HIV drugs um, and, or, and to order, conduct, and interpret lab tests necessary for HIV uh, therapies, um, both for folks who already have been diagnosed and for PEP and PrEP. Um, 
So those two kind of work in conjunction. Um, the protocols that will have to be created by the board that has to be done this year, uh, pre-January 1st, but the um, authority to actually do the prescribing, dispensing, and administering, and the ordering, conducting, and interpreting of lab tests, that will not go into effect until January 1st of 2026. So there's a year gap between the two. Um, I guess I'll stop and see if there's any questions on that real quick. Great. Yes, so that will be what the board has to create the protocol in conjunction with the university. And um, the Board of Medical Practice can be consulted, the Board of Nursing, community organizations, um, in order to develop that protocol. And I believe that those conversations have been going on for a few months now. And then we'll have a year. So, yeah. Oh, can you use your mic? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so then the following year, is that a like a feedback period before for the protocol? Or why is there then a whole other year gap? Or what's the practical? You'd have to ask Senator Dibble for on that. Oh, I'm not okay. sure why they, I think it's just to give uh, the pharmacies time to adjust. Um, Buck, do you have any insight into what the year delay is? If you don't mind, phone a friend. Buck Humphrey, I represent Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance amongst other clients. Um, thank you. Yeah, it, I think it mainly had to do with plan year, to be honest with you. There was language that, um, uh, prohibits prior authorization and step therapy for any HIV prevention medications. And so I believe it was to get on plan year. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, and really the way that this all shook out, all of the bills that passed, they were originally part of one omnibus and at and, and literally at 1152, the day that everything has to get passed at midnight, it all was rolled into one large omnibus with taxes and all these other things. So you ended up getting put into a 1400 page omnibus with many, many different things. And when I say that these bills almost died about 15 times in the last two days, I mean, literally, I thought nothing that impacted pharmacy, both the bills that you all wanted to bring and things that maybe, you know, not so much, um, were all going to die. Um, and I'll get into kind of, some of the political reasons at the end. Um, and and talk about that. Um, and then, like I said, House File 2466, it, it's just a companion to 1197. They work together to give the authority um, for those HIV drugs. Um, the Assistant Living Medication re Regime Review, a regimen review, um, I don't believe that this moved forward. Um, it didn't really impact the board. Um, and then the Medication Repos Repository Program requirements that were modified, that did go through um, and was signed into law in the gov by the governor on May 24th. Um, these these three, the patient specific use and uh, patient specific indication for use, the long term safety net repealer, and the registration, the insulin manufacturer registration fee, all went through as well and were signed into law. I know the insulin manufacturer registration fee is one of the newer proposals, and it didn't have a standalone bill. It got put into an omnibus, which was then rolled into that mega omnibus. Um, so if there are any questions on that, I think between Katrina and I, we could probably probably answer them, but it's, um, it wasn't something that the board was consulted on. It was just rolled out in an omnibus as a surprise. Any questions on that? No comment. <laughs> Um, and I guess on that, there are legal fees that were given to the board as well as part of the um, the appropriation from the governor's budget. So there was one point five million dollars that were that was appropriated to the board of pharmacy for those legal fees, um, just to like really put a pin in like how big of a like deal this is, or like really underscore the target for the entire committee was nine and a half million dollars and we took 1.5 million of that so I mean it was a really heavy lift and MMB and the governor's office um, were key partners in making sure that 1.5 million stayed 1.5 and wasn't watered down to some lower number so um, really important for for solvency and things like that yeah um, and then this was another new proposal that I don't think we had just that was discussed at a previous board meeting so um, actually, the 
Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance um, worked with the Commission of the Deaf, Deaf Blind, and Hard of Hearing, and they came up with this um, proposal that what the Commissioner of Health, Health in consultation with the Board of Pharmacy will conduct an assessment of licensed outpatient pharmacies and vendors for audible um, container labels and prescription readers. So this, um, we had a couple of hearings earlier in the year, um, and we knew that it was going to be a burden for a lot of pharmacies. So we were actually able to connect um, Mr. Humphrey with the um, government affairs person, Ms. Um, Alicia Lane at the commission, and they were able to come up with some compromised language that would work for the pharmacies, particularly our community pharmacies in mind, um, and would also work for, for the commission um, and for the, the patients themselves. Um, and then because the, you know, the health department does these sorts of studies, um, it made sense to have them conduct the study in consultation with the Board of Pharmacy since we don't, the board doesn't have the kind of staff capacity to do that. Um, so we'll be working on that with them. That will, that report has to go to the chairs and the ranking minority members of the Senate HHS committee and the House um, Health uh, Finance and Policy Committee by January uh, 15th of 2025. So we expect to be working with them over the next coming months um, about those braille labels. And I believe there's also federal funding for some of these braille labels. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to do a study. But could you kind of talk about that for a quick second? Uh, yeah, again, Buck Humphrey, uh, Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance for the record. Um, this was Senator Hoffman's legislation. And um, we did work with, as you said, over at MDH, uh, there's a or actually DHS, there's a sub agency for the deaf, deaf, blind, and um, hard of hearing. And so um, apparently across the country, they're trying to create a standard that for a patient who walks into any community pharmacy is going to have the same or similar experience. And so we worked with them to try to work over the next really three years to try to put together and hopefully you'll be uh, collaborating with us as well in terms of what makes the most sense for Minnesota patients in this area. Um, as you can imagine, any patient who has a need, um, we're obviously pharmacists and pharmacies are gonna do everything they can to put together a system that works for them. Some of them are even you know dots or number system, things like that. But usually a patient in this situation, we've been educated, um, it comes in with a representative, so we definitely want to have some type of, um, you know, even just a piece of paper that says these services, these accessible labels are, are possible. However, um, there, when we got into looking into what are the costs associated with having this, how, how do you have a Braille printer ready, how do you, um, especially the audible, um, turns out that most Walgreens, for example, every one of them has an audible option and probably Walmart too. Um, there are many community pharmacies that don't until they have a patient that presents themselves. So those were some of the issues that we looked at and we're trying to work with that commission and you all over the next several years with Senator Hoffman and others um, to put something in place. But we are hopeful of, because they did mention that there may be some resources for pharmacies who have to, who want to pr provide these to services to the patients. So we're trying to figure that out. We appreciate them kind of pushing it out a little bit, but um, there will be some things that go into place next year. So. Yeah, this was really compelling testimony. I mean, there were folks that were um, hard of hearing and blind and talking about, you know, mixing up medications. And if, you know, one was a blood pressure, blood, blood pressure medication, you can imagine, you know, if you mix that up with something that's for, you know, your allergies or something else that that could have really significant effects. And I mean, it was really emotional, the folks that were talking about the how this impacted their lives. Um, it was one of the more emotional testimonies in all of the committee all year. And that was actually saying a lot um, because it really just meant so much to these folks. I mean, they'd gone 40 and 50 years in some cases and never been able to really figure out their prescriptions, which sounds incredibly stressful to deal with on top of having chronic health issues. So i um, excited to continue this good work. Um, and these are the pharmacy, the board of pharmacy bills. So the relocation change of ownership and transfer of licenses, um, and then the revisions to the opioid opiate product registration fee program. We did push off um, kind of a not great amendment for the revisions to the opioid product registration fee, which would have required the board to take more proactive action. So we were able to keep that out, um, which is good. And now we have those zero reports for the opiate 
um, product registration fee program. And the one thing that we weren't able to do this year was the um, funding for the PMP program. We did get it introduced in the Senate, but um, we were told very uh, clearly that it wasn't going to get a hearing on the House side. Um, things could be shifting in that committee. Um, the committees that I'm referred to are Senate HHS and the House um, Committee on Health, Finance, and Policy. Uh, in the House, the chairs are term limited, and so we're likely to get a new chair in this new biennium. And there's potential that that could um, that could shift if we if the board decides to bring that bill again. Um, although funding may be a problem, we'll have to see what the budget looks like. So those were the big um, sort of changes. There's other things that I think you know related to prior authorization that are not really in the wheelhouse of of the board. Um, and if you had questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them offline. And now we're just looking to 2025. So as you all start thinking about things that um, you want to do and, and all that, we'll, we'll have conversations. Do you have a legislative and policy committee? Or is it just the board? Okay, great. So then I'll just work with all of you over the weeks. I just want to thank you, Lindsay, so much for coming. And it's, isn't it remarkable that she has only been in this role for six months? <laughs> uh, can we please give her a round of applause? Oh, <laughs> oh I will say I, one of the reasons why this is the one thing, last thing I'll say, and then I'll wrap up, is um, just to give you a sense of how the politics of things work. All of the bills almost died because of fight between the ophthalmologist and the optometrist. You might have seen this in the Star Tribune. Um, there's also an article in the Reformer about it. Um, but it literally, it, I mean, it, it took a Herculean effort um, to get it done at the very end. Everything that I just talked about that was in place that, you know, folks in all different, you know, parts of government and non-government were working on literally almost fell apart because of this. So I say that as a reminder of um, how these boards work and how these bills get passed are through omnibus bills. And you're thrown in with a bunch of other things. And it may not be your fight that tanks your priorities. It could be something else. Um, and so now I'm going to leave it on a really bummer note, <laughs> but just keep that in mind as, as we move forward in the next couple of years. Um, and there is, you know, this is an election year. So right now we have a trifecta where one party is in charge of, you know, the two branches of the legislature and then, and the governor as well. And that could shift this year. We don't know. So we could have a house controlled by one and that can make, um, poison pill bills even more of a possibility if that happens. So. This was with everybody on the same team, and we still almost lost it at the end. So just wanted to throw that out there. I always, yeah. <laughs> yes, and this board has so much thrown at it. I mean, I really can't say how much Jill and Katrina and, and Brock have, have helped me along and, and kept um, things moving and kept a lot of things, I think, from coming to the board uh, that would have made running this board even more challenging. And there are a lot of challenges. This board has a lot put on it that other boards do not. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and Brock is not here today, so I'm going to turn it over to Katrina. She will be um, presenting the controlled substance um, reporting section. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with integration because you just mentioned it. So that's PMP Gateway. Um, so 533 healthcare entities um, are connected using the integrated license um, that the board has been able to secure funding for up until September of 2024. So that, as we've talked about in previous meetings, um, funding that is always a, is a challenge and a little bit of a question mark. Um, as of April 1st, the statewide utilization of integrated access for prescribers is 102.9%, and for pharmacies, it's 52.4%. The utilization rate of over 100% simply means that a greater number of unique Minnesota prescribers are performing integrated searches um, during the evaluation period than are actually prescribing controlled substances. Um, other big news for the PMP, they um, had an, a request for proposal that was open for the PMP and the opiate product registration fee program. It was posted at the beginning of May and closed May 28th. All proposals have been reviewed. Next steps are interviews with the respondents. So that's also underway. And then regarding the opiate product registration fee program, um, those $250,000 payments were due June 7th. Nine of the 11 manufacturers have completed their payments, submitted their payments, and additional communications is being sent to the remaining two. 
Any questions or comments? All right, I'd like to move to the last um, item on the agenda. Um, those reports have been in your individual folders and have been uh, um, made available. Any comments, questions on the last item of agenda? It's my favorite part of the agenda um, right now because my stomach is growling again. Um, I would like to get a motion to adjourn today's meeting. Second. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all.